Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. How much of our sense of will is an illusion? How much of you is really you? Could there be something else, something alien, sometimes pulling the strings, influencing thoughts and behavior? It's been demonstrated that often many parasites are doing a lot more than just hanging out and living the good life. In some cases, these very simple organisms, these little worms and bacteria, seem to be calling the shots, making people and other animals behave in all kinds of uncharacteristic, sometimes very dangerous ways. Parasites can even drive their hosts to suicide. In the previous Possessed by the Parasite episode, I mentioned toxoplasmosis causing fast driving entrepreneurship, and also a greater tendency for mental illness, hypersexuality in men, and the opposite in women. There's a form of bacteria out there that goes even beyond that. The strains of Wolbachia can do some amazing things to their insect hosts. Altering the insect host's genetic code, changing their gender, killing their male offspring, and possibly even creating entirely new species out of their hosts. Wolbachia is a genus of intercellular bacteria that infects mainly insects, and also some roundworms. It's one of the most common parasitic microbes and possibly the most common reproductive parasite on Earth. These bacteria can infect a huge and diverse range of hosts, including all sorts of arthropods, insects, spiders, and isopods, all the way to the very distantly related nematode worms. Estimates suggest that at least 65% of the known species of insect carry Wolbachia. Compare that to the estimates of insect species, and you get a total of 10 to the 6th or a million different species that can play host to this thing. Insects have nearly been completely taken over by Wolbachia. The bacteria's interactions with its hosts are often complex, and in some cases have evolved to be more symbiotic than parasitic. Some host species cannot reproduce or even survive without Wolbachia infection. The Wolbachia bacteria have been affectionately referred to as the gonad chomping parasite. That would normally be a bad thing, but the gonads in this case belong to a mosquito that transmits dengue fever. Turns out that if you infect mosquitoes with Wolbachia, it can slow or even block the spread of dengue virus. Many forms of bacteria make homes on the surfaces of organisms, and even more love the body's interior on the surfaces of organs and connective tissue. Wolbachia is a bit more aggressive than that. It actually invades the insides of individual cells and establishes a home there. In the process, it's able to interact with and manipulate the host cell's components. For example, when a cell divides during mitosis, it creates a structure called a spindle, like a zip line, that helps pass copied DNA from the parent to child cell. Wolbachia locks onto the spindle line and make sure the new child cell also gets a healthy dose of bacteria. It's also figured out a way to hitch rides on the protein motors that move materials around within the insides of cells. Wolbachia uses these like little mopeds to move around within the host organism. The bacteria is tough and robust enough to survive for at least a week after its host death. This gives the parasite an even better chance to spread to new organisms. Although Wolbachia can grow in a variety of tissues, it has one site that's the favorite in almost every host organism, the sexual reproductive portion, the gonads. It finds its way into the eggs produced by females so that it can be passed on to new generations of victims. However, it's not content to simply get into as many eggs as it can. Instead, Wolbachia has evolved a number of ways to make sure that it can get as many of these infected eggs to go on to reproduce. One way, cytoplasmic incompatibility. Wolbachia can't be transmitted by sperm, so an infected male would appear to have little benefit to its reproduction. But that's actually incorrect. It's a bit more complicated. When an infected male sperm merges with uninfected eggs, the first cell division of the new embryo fails. On the other hand, when infected sperm merge with infected eggs, everything works just fine. So infected females end up having more offspring. Also, 
It seems that sperm from infected males brings along a protein that interferes with embryo cell divisions, while infected eggs produce another protein that inactivates this. Wolbachia also makes use of insect parthenogenesis, or asexual reproduction, to drive down the number of males. In many species of insects, males only have one set of chromosomes instead of two. Males develop from unfertilized eggs, while fertilized versions get two sets of chromosomes and end up producing females. Wolbachia uses this feature to get rid of the males entirely. Infected females produce unfertilized eggs that do one of two things. Produce a second set of chromosomes without dividing, or undergo a normal cell division that's followed by a collapse back into a single cell. Either way, the host animal winds up with two sets of chromosomes and goes on to develop as a normal, but parasite-infected female. Another of Wolbachia's methods, host feminization. In some hosts, the bacteria head for the organ that produces male sex hormones and destroys it, making sure the embryo develops as a female. It's not clear how the bacteria accomplishes this, but if insects are given antibiotics partway through development, the females will develop normally. However, the males that started out developing as females will end up being somewhere between the two sexes. Scientists have sequenced the genomes of several strains of Wolbachia, only to find there isn't a lot going on, and nothing seems very special about the parasite's genetic makeup. Wolbachia's genome is short and simple, around one to two million base pairs. They also seem to have an unusual amount of junk DNA compared to most other bacteria, with about 15% of the genome comprised of repeated elements like transposons and viruses. They also have a high number of duplicate genes. This seems to suggest the genome is in a dynamic state of flux. The bacteria also houses a stockpile of raw protein materials to fuel the evolution of new biological functions. There are some unusual things about these proteins in the bacterial stash. Many are short peptides, which could act as hormones or signaling molecules meant to manipulate their hosts. There are also lots of cell surface proteins that may help the bacteria penetrate host cellular systems. Still, this doesn't adequately explain how such a simple bacteria could get its host to do so many remarkably specific things. It still isn't clear what Wolbachia is doing on a molecular level. There's an interesting case that does help us understand the situation. Studies have shown that for fruit flies, being infected can actually be beneficial to the host. Wolbachia infection causes the female flies to produce four times as many eggs as their uninfected peers. Detailed studies of the reproductive tract of infected females shows that infected cells divide much more rapidly than uninfected cells in the same animal. Cell death also occurs at much lower levels with infection. Combined, these two effects give infected females a big reproductive advantage. So the Wolbachia is less a parasite than a symbiote or mutualist. The key gene for determining sex in fruit flies is called sex lethal, or SXL. There's a famous story about one research lab that had an SXL mute line of flies comprised of only sterile females. One day, out of the blue, the sterile female flies suddenly began producing offspring. The researchers figured there must have been a spontaneous mutation, and they mapped the miracle fly genome. It mapped to the SXL, or the sex lethal gene itself. So the researchers took the next step and sequenced the gene. To their surprise, they saw no changes in the code of the gene at all. This mystified the people in the lab for several years until someone, probably a smart student, finally suggested Wolbachia. Sure enough, treating the flies with antibiotics eliminated their fertility, and they went right back to being sterile. Scientists have already started doing further experiments to look at which other mutations can be overridden by this bacteria. With these genes identified, it should be possible to figure out what genes in the bacteria interact with them and start figuring out Wolbachia's manipulation methods. One tactic science has figured out. The enzyme aromatase is known to mediate sex change from male to female in many species of fish. 
Studies have shown Wolbachia can increase the activity of aromatase in developing fish and push male embryos toward feminization. There was a pretty big discovery in 2008 that led to a biotechnology revolution that's still relatively unknown to most of the public. In 2008, it was demonstrated that Wolbachia actually stops viruses from growing in mosquitoes. And since mosquito-borne viruses and other illnesses have basically been the bane of human existence, there was naturally serious interest in using this somehow in places where these diseases are major killers. Risk assessments have concluded the bacteria is safe, which does seem true, based on its proliferation in the insect community, with no documented harm to human beings. In 2016, it was shown to combat the spread of Zika virus through breeding and releasing mosquitoes that have been intentionally infected with a strain of Wolbachia. Later, in October of 2016, funding from various government agencies was allocated for the use of Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes to fight Zika and Dengue viruses. Deployment started in early 2017 in Colombia and Brazil. In July of 2017, Verily, the life sciences arm of Google's parent company, Alphabet Inc., announced a plan to release about 20 million Wolbachia-infected Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in Fresno, California, in an attempt to combat the Zika virus. In November of the same year, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency registered Mosquito Mate, Inc. to release Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes in 20 U.S. states and the District of Columbia. This new technology is really gaining steam fast. It's an approach not without risks, but it represents a promising new way of combating disease. It also makes me think about how interconnected everything is in nature, how everything seems to influence everything else. It also makes me wonder how separate we are. Am I a single will or the product of a chorus of voices, of influences? Sometimes I'm not sure. Stories about Wolbachia and toxoplasmosis make me think it's more complicated than it seems. Are there things affecting animals, including us this way, and we still have no idea? Science has achieved so much, but it's still very much like mapping a dark forest by candlelight. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.